right next to the Tallahassee Airport is a unique area. With some help from man, nature is just outside our back doors at the Tallahassee Junior Museum. We'll visit there today on Florida Naturally. Hi, I'm Carolee Boyle Sprinkle. Today we're visiting with Dana Bryan, the naturalist at the Tallahassee Junior Museum. The Junior Museum is just minutes from downtown Tallahassee, between Tallahassee and the airport. And it's kind of amazing to think that we have all this nature that close to town and that close to an area where you have a lot of planes coming and going. Dana, tell us something about what we're going to see out here today. You're right. It is an absolutely beautiful area. Lake Bradford is off here to the right, and it's a fairly large lake very close to the center of town. And from it, there are several lakes extending in either direction, east and west from it. It's part of an old series of uh, sinkholes and depressions forming these cypress lakes. As you see, there's cypress all around us as there are around most lakes in Florida. This is the, this is the pond cypress, as distinct from the bald cypress, which mm -hmm. you see down in rivers, uh, like at Wakulla Springs or along mo most of the free-flowing rivers, clear water rivers. This is dark water cypress ponds, has a lot of tannic acid and, and uh, sediments in it, uh, meaning that you can't see, you know, can't see down into it at all. The bald cypress is one of the larger southeastern trees. They're the ones, they're related to the uh, redwoods and the sequoias of out west, and so they're a, a huge tree. The pond cypress, though, is relatively small compared to it. These are full-size, mature pond cypress whose hair, especially that one over there under the wood, uh, that the wood duck box is attached to. Uh, they don't grow much higher than this, and they're not commercially important because of that, because of their fairly small size. Consequently, this whole area through here from the west end of Lake Bradford headed west has not been cut, even though some of it is in Forest Service hands now, and uh, even the private land has never been cut. So this is a, a virgin stand, which is quite remarkable. It's especially pretty around here. You can recognize the difference between the pond cypress and the bald cypress. The pond cypress has a very shreddy bark. Mm -hmm. So if you grab onto it and, and pull it, you could shred off a long piece of bark. The bald cypress is much tighter in the bark, and it doesn't have that appearance. Also, the specific name of the pond cypress is ascendens, which implies not only that the leaves are, are somewhat vertical in aspect, but they're tightly grouped. They don't fan out like you often see on the bald cypress. Those are two common characteristics that people use to distinguish it. What is the nesting box that you said is over there? That's a wood duck box. People in uh, the south especially enjoy our favorite waterfowl is the wood duck. It's a, one of the most beautiful birds in North America. And it's very common and uh, has had its ups and downs over the years. But now is on the comeback because a lot of people have put up wood duck boxes which simulate the tree cavities that they mm -hmm. normally nested in. A lot of the old, uh, large, bald cypress have been cut um, through forestry, and there aren't that many cavities available anymore. Most cavity nesting birds have had trouble in recent years because the old timber has been cut down. And so because people like the wood duck so much, and it's a popular hunting uh, bird, they've started putting up a lot of wood duck boxes. So we have one or two of our own. What are the kinds of wildlife are typical of this habitat? Almost anything you'd find in Florida would be found around the cypress ponds because that's where they would come for water. Uh, we have a lot of wildlife in Florida. We'll be seeing, probably today, we'll be seeing some deer we have here at the Junior Museum. Um, we'll see alligators. Almost any water in Florida has alligators. Uh, we'll be seeing uh, or hearing hawks and owls. and uh, There are a lot of things we won't see because most wildlife stays away from uh, daylight hours as well as man, like possums and raccoons and bobcats and things like that. But uh, we'll probably be seeing a lot of amphibians and reptiles and a few mammals here and there and a lot of birds. Well, let's walk on down there and see what we can turn up. Okay. Here are some of our deer here. We have two males and two females. As you can see, the male, the older male, has eight points already. You can see he's still in velvet. The velvet is a 
a supply of blood vessels for the growing antlers. The antlers are shed every year. They're not horns mm -hmm. that uh, like last for the life of an animal, but they are shed each year. Uh, the eight points, he, this is only his second year. The points indicate more his health than his age. Some people think that you can count points and mm -hmm. determine a, a buck's age, but really it's more of an indication of his health. They're a very large animal. People, I guess, are more familiar with deer than most other large mm -hmm. mammals, and they're in most zoos and in many places um, where the public can see them. But they're a very dangerous animal in terms of when you try to handle them. Mm -hmm. Not only they ex are extremely strong-legged uh, for escaping their predators, they're great jumpers and runners. And uh, if you try to catch a deer every once in a while, we've been in a circumstance where we've had to capture a deer and uh, you can't just go up and grab them and, and you know even if you have two or three people you can't just go and, mm -hmm. and grab them to capture them because they're so strong you really have to use trickery and uh, entice them with food mm -hmm. and things like that to get them into a, to a pen very hard to capture I would uh, think that hand. the antlers would be pretty dangerous if they uh, that too a lot of uh, I think the the deer are, uh, contribute to more injuries by zookeepers and mm -hmm. than any other animal, even though they seem really mild, and they are sort of mild-natured, but, uh, but their legs, their kicking ability, and the ability to, uh, to uh, jump and run with a, a relatively heavy body uh, makes them especially dangerous. They're real nice to look at, though. They, they are so dainty looking. Very agile. They're, these are white-tailed deer. Uh, people often see the tails just when they're down, but if they lift them up mm -hmm. in danger or something, uh, the white on the back side of their tail is a great signal for the rest of the deer in the herd to be able to follow the leader crashing through the woods, escaping from something. Do you expect these to breed here? Will they breed in captivity? Uh, I don't hear about it too often. I would, I would tend to doubt it. Um, but uh, it's possible. Our habitats here at the <coughs> museum are quite large, mm -hmm. and uh, they do have plenty of room to move around. Let's work our way uphill a little bit. We'll start okay. to see some different vegetation, and maybe if we're lucky, we'll see some different kinds of animals that are more associated with the hardwood forests. Let's work our way this way. All right. higher land. This is probably seven or eight feet above the water mm -hmm. table. You can see around us there are all sorts of oaks here. Instead of the cypress and the black gum that we saw down in the in the swamp, those trees are there because they're inundated. Their roots are inundated most of the year and they require that and they're the only species that can survive down there. You won't find any oaks down there in the water like are up here and likewise there are no cypress up here. Here we have many different kinds of oaks. The live oaks are the biggest ones here. There are water oaks here, and there's laurel oaks over here. There's a couple of spruce pines scattered through. The spruce pine is the only pine that you'll find in the, in the wooded sections, mm -hmm. deeply wooded sections around here. <clears throat> there are higher nutrient levels. There's more leaf fall, and, and the, the uh, nutrient level in the ground is is uh, increased somewhat, although it's still not a very fertile area. We're very, we have a lot of sand under here, and uh, over the years, some nutrients increase, you know, build up, but uh, not a good deal. This area actually is, is part of the piney woods uh, type of habitat. Along the edge of the water, you will have a zone of oaks, but if you get up any further away from the water, you start getting into the piney flatwoods. Mm -hmm. Most of that now has been uh, replaced by hardwoods because there hasn't been annual burning coming through, and the, the pine has been cut in the past. Would this be pine if, if there had been annual burning, or is this uh, natively? Well, we're right in a transition. I wouldn't make a bet one way or another. The pines, certainly some pines would start coming down, would come down this far, but because of fluctuating water mm -hmm. levels, floods over the years, um, the oaks would be filling in a, a zone around the, the lake edge, and we might be standing. I mean, this seems to be 
a, a good place for oaks. So this here. is probably pretty variable from decade to decade, say, under normal conditions. Uh, not so much variable. You would, you know, a thousand years ago, you probably would have found the same sort of oak, mixture of oaks, <clears throat> a lot of shrubs around the ground, sparkleberry, uh, a lot of other uh, things like that. I noticed a uh, um, persimmon back here. These, the mixture is greater here than on either side of it in the piney woods or in the cypress edge because, uh, because it is restricted mm -hmm. from fire from that side and from this side it has a, a more stable environment. We see above us here the live oak. It's probably the grandest tree of the south, maybe the symbol of the south. They grow very large, has a lot of pretty resurrection fern and draped with Spanish moss all the time. Those are because the, the uh, climate around here is so moist all the time. The Spanish moss is an epiphyte, and the ferns, of course, grow in, in damp weather. And uh, so it's always, it's always pretty along the Gulf Coastal Plain. The live oaks are especially interesting because they used to be of, of great interest to shipbuilders. A lot of the early explorers that came through Florida, and if they ever had to build a ship, they would go to the live oaks and cut these long, arching limbs and use them as the ribs in the ship. Mm -hmm sort of interesting, just a few months ago, some people came down from Mystic Seaport in Connecticut where they were repairing one of the old whaling ships and they were looking for live, uh, live oak limbs to replace a certain part of the ship. And they looked and looked and finally found one that was just right and they cut it and they brought it back up to Connecticut. Also at the same uh, time, it's interesting, they found that the boards, the original boarding on the uh, the ship was made out of yellow pine or the longleaf pine, which also came from down mm -hmm. south. You can see on the trees the resurrection fern. It's a small type of fern that grows on trees in Florida, especially the live oak. And when it's dry, it all curls up and turns brown, and you don't notice it. But then as soon as it rains again, it all resurrects and comes, comes forth in a beautiful little green sprig. And it's all over these trees now because it's been raining the last couple of weeks. It's draped with Spanish moss. We have some close by here. Spanish moss is a relative of the pineapple, which is unusual. It's an epiphyte, which means it's an air plant. Mm -hmm. It will grow on telephone wires as well as, as on uh, trees and shrubs, indicating that it does not root to the, the, uh, the plant it's growing on. It's not a parasite, but it lives on its own. It's nice and green now because it has been raining. When, it's, uh, when it hasn't been raining, it turns all brown and dry. But now it's starting to bloom. Actually, there's mm -hmm. a bloom over here. It used to be used for stuffing of mattresses and furniture. Not so much anymore because there's so many synthetic fiber mm -hmm. fabrics around. I guess it would make a nice spongy. Behind us is a slough that runs from Lake Bradford into the neighboring lakes. As we walk down the hill here, we can see the rapid transition from the hardwoods mm -hmm. that we've been looking at down into the wetter environment where the cypress and the black gums will start coming in. It's a very sharp transition. Oh, well, the water is right up to the edge here. Sure is. Here's the edge of the water right here, Carol Lee. We're up on the, one of the museum's elevated boardwalks. If you look back in this direction, you can see the transition zone I referred to. Mm -hmm. There's a rapid stopping of the oaks, the rim of saw palmetto, which runs around all these cypress lakes. There are a few transition species, like the red bay, and there's a couple of swamp maples in here. And then all you find is the black gums and the cypress from here on out. These are the species that can survive in standing water, and the water level now is about the typical high water level that would be experienced each year. If you look back here, actually there are coincidentally four trees in a row which show the natural order. Back there is the laurel oak, and then right here is the red maple, the black gum, and the cypress. And that's exactly the order that you would find, especially the black gum is right on the edge here, 
and the cypress is usually inundated at least at part of the year. Look over here, Carly. I see. Oh, look at him. I see there's a what they call a blue tail skink sometime. Actually, he's a five line southeast southeastern five line skink. His blue tail only shows when he's a juvenile. As they grow older, they lose their blue tail and the stripes on their bodies, and they became they become just a sort of a uh, dull brown color. Kind of nondescript. Right, but they're very beautiful when they're young. It really, is a pretty thing. They eat little uh, grubs and larvae in the wood at this stage of their life. Uh, maybe a little insect, anything that moves that's about the size that they can eat, they will. Do they inhabit just wet areas, or do you find them in drier areas, too? Yeah, they'll get up into dry areas. Actually, when you're walking in the woods and you hear a little scurrying under the leaf, it's mm -hmm. usually a, a five-line skink diving for cover. But they'll come down here on the edge and live on these uh, dead logs where they find a lot of food. Let's walk on out. This is really pretty out here. We're very lucky to have this uncut cypress edge running around a good bit of the museum. This is actually Forest Service land here. Oh, is it? So it's not part of the museum proper. Right. We have permission to build this boardwalk here. And oh, they're a good neighbor across the way. So we're actually standing out on Forest Service, over Forest Service land now. Right. Their boundary comes right through here. There's some other things we can look at here. This here is button bush. Button bush is a, a shrub that will germinate when it's dry. Here, just a couple of months ago, it was very dry. There was none of this water was here that we see now. It's only come back in the last several weeks. And it'll germinate when it's dry, but then when the water comes back, button bush is well adapted to survive in wet conditions. Mm -hmm. Why is it called button bush? The uh, flower capsules and the seed capsules are little button-like round uh, objects like that, and uh, they show white, and uh, people call it button bush because of that. Mm -hmm. This grass we see here is called maiden cane, and it is an aquatic grass. You see it in all the, the lakes around Tallahassee. Here it's quite thick through here. One of the other lakes here in the chain, it's completely covered with uh, the uh, maiden cane. You can almost walk right out on it. It's so thick. So that's well adapted to the aquatic situation, too, and not right. something that dies back. It is an aquatic grass. When the water recedes, it will live um, after the water has gone back, mm -hmm. but it is an aquatic grass. I see that a lot of the cypress trees have a real large base. Is that another adaptation to the aquatic existence, or is that something else? Apparently, when, when trees are in a wet situation, the taproot doesn't form, it doesn't grow very deep. Mm -hmm. Usually taproots grow seeking water, and of course if it's in standing water, the mm -hmm. taproot won't be, won't grow uh, very large. And in such a situation, they're very, they, a tree would tend to be top heavy, and every, any heavy wind would tend to try to tip it over. So apparently the thin tops and the thick bases tend to keep the center of gravity low. Also, we don't see any knees here, but cypress knees uh -huh. probably have the same function by interlocking the roots of neighboring trees. The uh, breathing function that you hear about from time to time apparently isn't so. There's been some research that tried to substantiate that and failed. So it's probably just to keep the center of gravity low on them and to help support them upright. Is this a pretty typical water level for this time of year, or is this unusual? I know we've had kind of a wet couple of weeks here. Now, this is typical for the high water level each year. July is the rainiest month in Tallahassee, and now we're in late August, and the water is still high because it has been raining fairly regularly. Uh, a couple of months ago, it was dry, and a couple of months from now, it'll be back pretty, you know, back pretty far. Um, and it won't be high again, this high again, until next year about this time. The changing water levels are sort of interesting. We have a lot of drought conditions in Tallahassee fairly regularly and throughout Florida. And when that happens, a lot of the lakes tend to disappear. There's a little alligator coming right up between the trees. I said alligators live anywhere where you find uh, little amounts of water, and uh, it's true enough here. We're going to, in a minute, go down and see our gator who came out of Lake Bradford here. Mm -hmm. And he's maybe in 80 years, this gator will be the size of that one. Well, he's just coming right over here to see us, isn't he? 
When people come in in canoes through here, do you permit them to beach and come into the museum that way? No, there's no access through the water to the museum. Uh, most of the canoes access through the FSU reservation on the east end of Lake Bradford, and they have they can canoe across the lake and then through the slough and up through the series of lakes west of there. In high water, they can go all the way for about uh, four miles. They can canoe, and it's beautiful the whole way. It's just like this, where the mm -hmm. the cypress have not been cut, and it's it's really back in the wilderness. He's a cute little gator. That he really gator, is. you can tell he was born last year. They're about six or seven inches long when they're born, or when they're hatched, I should say, and grow about a foot a year. So you can tell he's too big for this year, mm -hmm. and so small that you know he was born last year, probably late last year. When they're that size, they'll eat little aquatic insects and little shrimp, anything small that they can uh, grab. Sometimes they'll eat snails and things like that. He really goes through that grass very well. Yeah, you can see when they swim, they lay their legs back alongside and use their tails. They don't paddle with their feet at all. Well, we saw a little gator. Now let's go see a big one. That first one was about a foot and a half. This one's about 12 feet. Oh, goodness. The first one was about a year and a half old. This one's probably about 80 years old. Wow. The kids call him Muhammad Ali Gator, which uh, is fitting. Yeah, I should say. He's a big fella. How long have you had him? About five years. Uh, he came right out of Lake Bradford here, where he probably lived there for pretty much his entire life, I guess. And uh, when people were building around the edge of the lake, he would start coming up on their lawns just where he had laid for all those years. Mm -hmm. and I understand he broke up a birthday party one night, and they called the Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. That would do it. Who is responsible for uh, picking up nuisance gators mm -hmm. like that. And uh, they brought him over here and gave him to us. We had just finished the habitat about five years ago. And you say it would take 75 to 80 years for one to get from the size we just saw to him? About. They, there's controversy over how old gators get, but uh, the people who I think are probably most knowledgeable say that an 80-year-old gator would be a, an old gator, and this one is an old gator. He's, he's got one eye, one bad eye you can see, uh -huh. but he gets along real well without it. He'll bump into a tree once in a while, but he does real well. How long have they been around on Earth? Oh, millions and millions and millions of years. Uh, I imagine they go back probably to the Triassic around then. There, there's a uh, fossil gator skull that was found that was five feet long. The skull, the skull alone was five, was feet, five long. feet long. Uh, so they've been around for a long while, and they're, they're king of the jungle is in the waters around the southeast anyway. I guess there's not much that would mess with them. No wonder they get so big. That's right. The uh, raccoons and I know great blue herons and mm -hmm. other animals, small animals like that, might eat them when they're only a foot or a foot and a half long. But after they get much bigger than that, there's not much that'll uh, eat them, except other gators. The gators are cannibalistic to some extent. And uh, a little gator might be eaten by his dad one day. What do they feed on, generally? Uh, Full-size gators will eat mostly turtles and gar, I'm told, garfish. Uh, smaller gators will eat insects and shrimp and small fishes and uh, even snails, apple snails, mm -hmm. I understand, are a favorite food of, of small gators. Do they actually pursue their prey or do they just lie in wait and until yeah. somebody comes along? Everybody is familiar with the gator with just his nostrils and his mm -hmm. eyes showing. And that's the way they usually spend their time waiting for prey. They're very quick, quick runners and quick swimmers, but uh, usually the animals they would eat are much quicker than that. And uh, so they have to wait for someone to come within grabbing range, and, uh, and they can move very quickly. They normally lie in a pretty straight line, but when, there's, when any prey comes near, they whip into a U-shape. They're, of course, one huge muscle, and they can whip into a, a U-shape, and if, it's, if the animal is down near their tail, it'll tend to knock it towards the head, and the head is coming around at the same time. And they usually grab things sideways when, they're, uh, when somebody comes near. They'll eat ducks and uh, anything, really, that comes within range. Even uh, 
even a full-size deer might be grabbed by the leg if wow. it comes down to the water and drinks and be dragged into the water and, and drowned. So even a small child isn't real safe around a medium-sized alligator. Right. There are very few gator attacks. I, I was reading the other day that there was something like 45 attacks reported in the last 10 years, which is an average of four or five a year. Usually, uh, as soon as the alligator realizes it's a person that it's grabbed, it lets go. Uh, usually they occur when somebody is swimming at night mm -hmm. or is uh, mucking around on the shore and kicking up a lot of mud and not, um, not being aware of, of uh, the confusion they're causing right. for the gator who's just looking for something to eat. Sounds a lot like sharks and the way people get into situations with sharks, too. In that same time, in 10 years, there have only been, I think, four fatalities. Mm -hmm. So the people's fear of alligators is, is probably not well-founded in terms of uh, them actually hurting people. But they are a ferocious predator, and, and you would be wise not to swim in an area where, they're, where large ones are known mm -hmm. to be. I, I know it hasn't been that many years since they were not only not very many nuisance gators, but they were really pretty scarce. There was a, of course, for years and years they were hunted uh, commercially, and there was a point towards the uh, end of that, of that commercial hunting where more and more people got into doing it, and the gator was just about wiped out throughout the southeast. Their numbers were uh, vastly reduced, and it became protected. The United States federal government protected it as well as the state governments protecting it. And after that happened, the gator started coming back. They, were, they lay 40, 30 to 50 eggs a year, and they, their population came right back. And now there's, people think there's as many gators as there ever were. Louisiana already allows hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, Florida is thinking of opening a couple of uh, lakes in Gainesville to commercial gator hunting this year, just as a, on a trial that. basis. And I imagine it'll only be maybe another year or two when they'll, they'll start thinking about opening the season. Uh, elsewhere in the state. Well, hopefully they'll be able to manage this as a resource and not have the same thing happen to it again. Well, Dana, I sure appreciate you coming out and spending the time with us to take us around the museum today. And it's really nice to know that there's this much in the way of a, a natural and wildlife resource that's so close to Tallahassee that residents can come out and enjoy just about any time. The Junior Museum has a fortunate uh, position on this chain of lakes. It's really beautiful along here and there's several lakes off here and it's a great place to come and canoe. We hope people come out and enjoy it more. Thank <laughs> you.